Okay, so today we're doing origin of flight. Okay, and we'll talk about why in a second, but first we're going to do some sort of course mechanics. Um, you'll notice the quizzes, which we'll get, get to, like little clickers. So there have been a few problems with clickers. Some of you still didn't, doesn't register properly, um, which is a pain in the neck, frankly. Um, also, clickers don't have a short answer. And so just to, I mean, well, technically you could, you know, it's like sending a text on an old style phone, you could put short answers in. That would be cool. Um, <coughs> so try to do some paper-based paper quizzes and tests. Um, well, not tests, but quizzes and short responses. Um, it would be like the regular class ones where sometimes it's, you know, two points for any answer, sometimes it's one point for showing up, two points for quick answer. Okay. Um, <coughs> and so you'll see you tab one of those right now. Okay. Um, other course mechanics. Um, you have a paper coming up in early November. You have some questions about this. This is the topic review. Right? So it's a thousand words, including references. Um, and again, that's, you know, what I, you know, the, the goal. You can go 25% or over, maybe, you know, 10% under. It's, you know, don't, so don't sit there counting words, but also don't write a 20,000 word essay. Um, you know who you are. Um, okay, and so, and if you want to bounce a topic off me, you can, okay, um, but I will, I'm, you know, pretty open to topics, just something relevant to macroevolution, okay, science macroevolution, um, and so it should be a scientific question, and say what's known about it, what's going to work on it, what work might be done in the future, okay. Um, before we do, I'll send you out my rubric for grading, so you can see how much I'll weight references versus other things. So you know what you can, and other other elements, so you know what to target. Okay. <coughs> um, references should be properly formatted, um, using some style. Okay. I'm not going to. I'm not going to say okay. Titles have to be bold versus not bold, or things like that. I'm not going to check you on that. But you should be able to something where I can see what the what the paper was. So where is the published title, journal, um, volume. Year authors. I mean, stuff you've been seeing. Okay. <coughs> Works individual on that. Okay. Um, and it'll be smarter signs we can check for plagiarism. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Also, yeah. Uh, yeah. Is there a number of if you do fewer than five, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, but you could do a thousand. I mean, you shouldn't do a thousand because we'd run out of the word count. But you can do as many as you want. Yeah. Good. Other questions? Okay. You also have a pair presentation coming up at the end of the year. Okay. Um, some of you have already started working on this. Um, I haven't assigned the pairs yet. Is it kind of odd? Um, Normally, I assign pairs and sort of I like group students by ability so that we don't have um, a student who tends to do lots of work dragging along a student who doesn't. Um, <coughs> that said, if you want to work with someone in the class, um, then you have various outside collaborations, you may. Just let me know. Um, if I don't hear from you by next week, I'll do the assignment. Okay? Um, and with the pair presentation, the goal is to get money. So something that a scientist is a very useful skill. Um, you write a compelling research case and say, if you give me money to do this, I will solve this big question in my field, but it's also relevant to other fields. In the meantime, I will help um, deal with representation, you know, bringing more people into science and that sort of thing. Okay. So it's a very important skill to get. Um, normally you don't do it by PowerPointing, but it's good to people to see each other's work. Okay. Um, minute talk, you know, you can use PowerPoint, Keynote, Open Office, whatever you want for the presentation itself. Yeah? No, no, no. No. It, only presentation, right. Um, if you want to add text in the speaker notes, you can. Um, yeah, you don't, I mean, so you see the first sort of when, it, when it, we do lectures in class, right, I mean, we don't have a ton of bullets typically on each slide because it's not often not an effective way to communicate. 
Um, don't feel you have to spit out, you know, tons of text on the slide either. Okay, but you want to you want to be able to answer these questions. Well. Um, I haven't, actually, you don't need to address broader impacts for this, yeah. So, what you asking about with broader impacts, so the National Science Foundation funds a lot of our research, and they evaluate proposals on two criteria. One is intellectual merit, which is what you might expect, you know, how does it advance science? And the other is broader impacts, which is how do you bring underrepresented groups into science? How do you do outreach to the community? How does it affect broader world, right? So if I study fungus and I figure out that's a way I can, from studying this fungus I can find a way to create a new biofuel that will, you know, save the, save the atmosphere and just prevent global warming, right? That would be a broader impact too, okay? Um, <coughs> and so we're actually running these for real to deal with both of those, so that both of them matter. For this class we're going to talk about the intellectual merit part. Good. Other questions? And references to your slides, this can be like Smith 2001. It doesn't have to be um, the full Smith JP 2001 science on the origin of species to. Okay. Other questions about this? All right. So a few quick questions to make sure you're on track with learning stuff. Um, so, first one. And today's date is the 23rd of October, Mole Day. Mole Day? Chemistry? No one? 6.02 times 10 23rd articles per mole? Come on. <coughs> what kind of calendars do you guys buy? Oh, yes, so, so those who came in late, you, you used paper for this one. Yeah. Oh, here. There's one right there. Everyone has paper? So you just write your name and then all you do is circle A, B. These I'm going to assume you're honest, so we can talk about the answers, and that might even help learning. If I see people changing their answers later, we'll have to just go through them all and then answer questions later. But we'll assume, we're, assume everyone's honest here. Uh, <coughs> what's the right answer? B. Yeah, good. Monitoring. Okay. Sorry, I type this to be, oh, sorry, it allows others to persist. Okay. All right, what's the correct answer? Everyone, so why is it A? Right, right, right. So it's, you know, as a particular strategy, it's able to affect the new evolution. So if you have other strategies evolve, you can't displace the strategy. Okay. At least in a set of pre computed strategies, right? 
it's possible that some other strategy that you have in your system could evolve, could evolve. But the ones you, moment you consider in your experiment, the ESS is the one that can persist. All right, and finally, just a very short answer. One more minute. <coughs> All right, so what's the answer? Um, and remember, with both of them, I mean, with mutualism, the, the, they're not trying, trying to help each other, it just happens such that they help each other, right? They're evolving to help themselves. And sometimes it has a negative effect, sometimes it has a positive effect. Sometimes it's the same system, it can vary depending on other conditions. Sometimes ants farm aphids, sometimes they eat them. Um, so we're going to talk about evolution of flight. So first of all, how many times has flight evolved? What are they? Insects? Bats? Birds? Pterosaurs. Yes, so dinosaurs. So, yes, it evolved in dinosaurs, but birds, pterosaurs aren't dinosaurs. They're separate. Okay. And so, what's the overall learning outcome I want to do is talk about sort of how you understand how we have this complex trait flight and how, in some sense, it's the same trait, right? You have to power yourself above the ground. <laughs> but it's evolved very different ways. Okay, multiple times. Okay, so here's the four cases. Alright. So, <coughs> and again, think of what's required for flight, right? There's some way of creating lift, right? And it's not the only adaptation also. What? Right, be light, be light enough such so the lift you create is enough to lift your body. Yep. It can be metabolically costly at first, right? I mean, so once you're, you know, soaring or gliding, you don't have powered flight anymore. Maybe it's easy, right? But the lift off starts with a lot of energy. Um, and rapid muscle movements. That's why if, if it's a cold day, bees will vibrate to warm themselves up to get the flight muscles working. Then they'll take off. Right? So they'll be able to generate enough, fast enough, in beats. Okay? <coughs> why might evolution of flight be hard? Right, so we have all these requirements to start with. Good, that we talked about. Uh, what else? Mm 
Right. Yeah, so what's good being able to half fly? Right. And so he'll talk about uh, you know cases that get around the difficulty, but at first, like, that's a big problem. Like, look at it and say, okay. So I can see why being able to do this is great. If you're just a goose in a pond and then crashing into trees at the end of the pond, things are very adaptive. Right? How do you go from that to finish the evolutionary process to get flight? We'll talk about some ways that might have happened. All right, so the most famous flying things are, of course, birds. Um, <coughs> and, well, um, how do birds fly? Birds are not going to fly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have breath bones, muscle attachments, so they can flap their wings. Yep. What are their wings derived from? Forelimbs, right. So they're the four, the modified forelimbs. Yep. <coughs> um, they also have you know, light hollow bones. They have Ways to get rap rapid respiration. Okay. <coughs> um, they also have feathers, right? So a plucked chicken doesn't fly very well. Okay. So the feathers allow you to have greater wing surface, right? Though adding a lot of weight. Okay. So one thing people often think about is you know pre-adaptation, post-adaptation, or when you're thinking about about. Um, Acceptation versus adaptation, that sort of thing, right? So, did feathers evolve for flight? No. Why did feathers evolve? I think insulation, right? So they arrive from scales, and so they're a way of keeping endotherms, keeping their body heated. Okay. And they also have roles in sexual selection too. Right? And that's the way their body colored, and that's in their feathers too. <coughs> we now have fossil evidence that you know, even some large theropods were feathered. Okay. So we definitely, and they definitely weren't flying. Um, so this is the evidence of feathers evolving before flight. Okay. And here you see um, phylogeny, evolution of feathers, Okay, here are phylogeny, and here you can see um, when various words Um, one thing to think about also is how do we know this? How do we create this phylogeny? Right, because the specimens we have into DNA, right? We don't observe anything here or here with the fossils. Mm -hmm. Morphological analysis and Here, and another character here. 
that was shared by using that back. And so a tree that has this arrangement is more um, reasonable and approximately reasonable than one that has this tree involving multiple times. And so structures like that which you refer quite largely, even though you have no data on the fossils and all that. It's always good to think about how do we know what we know and where people could be, people could, people could be wrong. Right? <coughs> and here's a, another phylogeny of birds here. And a lot of birds, most of the birds we see are passerines, perching birds, which are one particular clade of birds. Okay. Okay. And another question is, when did this persecution happen? Um, and here's a study that argues that they had, um, for the KT, most major bird leaders diverged. The persecution of them was not that um, Early work on mammals found the same sort of thing. We've had many mammal ranges pre KT, the actual diversity of them happened after. So in terms of evolution of flight in birds, there are three main theories right now. Okay. Running, gliding, and incline running. Okay. So two of them are obvious. Right? So <coughs> the running idea, if you're Archaeopteryx and you're chasing grasshoppers or something, and it's a small insect, right? If you're running, if you can push the forward more, and you'll go faster. Okay? And so you start having selection for you know, push yourself forward more while chasing, okay? Or you get to steer while running. Um, <coughs> and so that is an appealing theory because it has, you know, suction for adding force, okay? Which first is forward pointing, then you can point it down and it's lift, okay? Um, <coughs> and also for evolution of sort of steering, too. Okay? So you can explain why you might have a feathered tail so you can turn. That's one theory. Um, sorry. Another theory is gliding, right? So we see lots of animals glide. Um, there's cases of gliding lizards, <coughs> gliding snakes, gliding frogs, gliding squirrels, <coughs> gliding squid. Um, so, yeah, they don't climb up something, they, they shoot out of the water, glide, and go back down. A flying fish. Yeah. Um, we do everything. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's good squid. Yeah. We'll talk about squid later. Yes. Yeah. So the, 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 it's presented as a potential route to getting flight, such that if you're, you know, if you start off being able to, you know, so, you know, if you're under selection for you'll jump off perch and glide next tree, or first jump to the next tree, and then if you can glide you can get a little further to the next tree, and so you can have selection for that, and so just create selection for lift. Right. Um, the problem with that is then you also need to add some way to get powered flight in there. Right. And it could be that we see so many gliding animals are not powered in, but not flying animals because it's hard to go from the gliding to the flying. Okay. But it does get you potentially a light body to be how important gliding is, and it gets you lift surfaces. Okay. <coughs> Another theory that's a recent one is incline running. So this doesn't make much sense because of the little video showing it. So if you take a little chick and say, here, go climb this wall. It can be marine. Um, and see what happens. Okay, they use their wings to help them get up a wall 
before they can fly. Because they can't fly at all yet. <coughs> but they can use their wings to give them a little extra force to go up the wall. Okay? And so if this sort of situation were common, um, not just in chicks, but where you had to go up and up inclines, you could have selection for, you know, using four limbs with feathers to help give some lift. Right? And the advantage of this is this gives you power, evolution selection for power right away. Okay. So these are various competing ideas. So what we're going to do is break up into groups and figure out, okay, we have these three ideas. And you see you can do some experimental tests. So, you know, using one time and find sounds stupid. Right? And you can say, oh, look, every way of data shows it helps. Right? But how would you test this for birds in general? Which which route led to evolution of flight? I'm trying to figure out how how you can solve this as a paleontologist or evolutionary biologist. Is it breaking up into groups of two? Let's start talking about it. All right, one minute. Okay, so let's start talking about it. Let's start with you guys in the back corner. We'll move this way. Okay, so what do, you, what do you think? Sorry, I'm just finally going to think of, of sort of thing, I don't know if I'm just thinking of like pushing birds oh, off of things. things. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, but can you, I mean, your idea is great, actually. Yeah. So, sorry. Um, so, right, you could see how effective, I mean, that's a very good idea, seeing how effective wings are in things that don't use them for flight. Yep. Um, and, I mean, yeah, I mean, amputation of wings might be unethical, but you can bind wings or something like that. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, and then it would be interesting to see how they're how they're used. Um, there might be problems with that. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, ostriches are, are probably the, you know, things like that are maybe the best analog to pre pre flight birds, but also they don't have teeth anymore, they might do prey, so those factors too. It would be interesting to see, I mean, to see the about how are wings adaptive in running. That's what it's good. Those are taking, coming, coming for their wings. <laughs> I mean, you can't, people have done, I mean, you can do behavioral experiments with ostriches. I mean, people have, I know people have done, like, ostriches running on treadmills to see how the ostriches Good. What do you think? Yeah, we'll think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just tell, but yeah, it's true. Yeah, and the and the idea of you know looking to see you know was Archaeopteryx evolved like, built as a runner? And that was a great way to test to see. I mean, if it's definitely not, if it's just sort of for skittering up trees and then jumping off, oh well, it's probably gliding, not running. So that'd be a good way to test it. Yep. Um, and you're right. In terms of fossil like habitat, do we know about inclines? I mean, right. So trees have in trees can be thought of as inclines. Um, I'm not sure what other info, info in the fossil record would tell you about topography. You know, in the Jurassic. You could probably tell something about like um, what the animals lived in stream to that point. If you have slow running stream versus fast running stream, tell you something about hilliness. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, that's, it's a weird idea because it's sort of, it's a subset of running, and, but it's it's very hard to test. Yeah. Good. Oh, Susan was looking at sort of like development of behavior as a correlate for evolution of behavior. Hmm. That would be interesting for um, I'm not sure if that's been done for anything else. I mean, there's the, I mean, there's the old, old idea that, you know, ontology recapitulates phylogeny, right? And so you can see, and it's sort of similar in flavor to that, but it's, it's in terms of behavioral development rather than morphological development. Um, and of course, the idea for morphology, I mean, it's not really completely true, but it's interesting. But in terms of behavior, we can see, yeah, what sort of leads to. Yeah, I don't know. Cool. Um, 
Mm -hmm. Right, so do a phylogeny, figure out, okay, we might not know what the ancestry of birds did, but we can predict from everything else that it's probably, you know, a cursorial carnivore. Yeah, I mean, you could look to see, I mean, look at modern birds and figure out what traits correlate with being a flyer versus a glider more often. And then look at those, we can flip those traits back in time. Right? I mean, it's like, you know, Archaeopteryx didn't have a great, a great uh, breastbone, so it could do a lot of active flapping flight. We could do some. Right, so you can reconstruct on a bird phylogeny what states at the root. Um, the only problem with that, and it's good, is that there's been all this history since then. So it could be that the birds that have survived the KT were those that were some subset in some way that were unusual. But you're right, I mean, it's a way of getting at this. So one way is to go from the bottom up and look at the extinct relatives. I can do an estimate. One way is to look at the modern relatives and get that estimate from some way of and you compare them, that would be cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's good, yeah. So, I mean, I really like how people think about some modern examples and then extinct morphology, and now the engineering analysis. When you look at the structure and say, okay, the wings, the, this wing definitely has evolved to take loadings in this direction. So maybe it's made for, it's, it's primarily, you know, it's being selected for flapping, whereas this wing is primarily selected for being held rigid and reacting for gliding. That'd be a very interesting way of doing it, looking at it. I know people have done that sort of force thing looking at um, things like, you know, T-Rex bite force and whether it could handle, you know, if it, is it just biting off the Zicarian or is it dealing with a, right, you know, a very angry Triceratops that's twisting and can it handle those sort of torsional forces. I imagine that's been d done for, for, for flight too, but I don't know. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a testing for counter adaptations and whatever is affecting the flight. 
That's a really good, good example. Yeah. Yeah, so actually, so I moved back to Gene Tree's P63 lecture, but we'll get to this a bit more in that lecture. Um, but yeah, we have. So here's a tree that is growing fatter. Okay. Um, <coughs> you can look at if uh, I have copies of Gene A. And this, and then there's a sister allele B, and this. It could be that the phylogeny of those genes is that. Right? So there's duplication back in time when the A and B lineages diverged, and then now this has A and B, this has A and B, and this only has A. Right? And so that way you can figure out okay, these copies are regulated back here. Um, so you could do that sort of thing for flight genes. Actually, this is one way actually we root the whole tree of life. When we have a tree of archaea, eukaryotes, and new bacteria, I tell where the root is. Right? Root root anywhere. And we do it based on these sort of shared genes. It tells you where the root might have been. I mean, the, the, the problem in this context could be when you expect it all to be you know, that ginger evolved somewhere in the bird lineage. It might be hard to tell exactly how far back. But there are ways, I mean, so you can tell whether it's based some changes it here, it evolved all the way back here. So you could actually have some data about that. That'd be really interesting. Yeah. And we do. We have seen people look at like really cool trends in both insects and birds. That on islands you lose flight, and on birds, I thought, okay, well, you don't have to do anti predator predator escape. So that's one reason. And this is thought that if you're on an island, most places you fly to are wet and deadly. And so it could be, a, or if you're, if you're swept out to sea, it's wet and deadly. So advantageous to minimize flight time. So after that, okay. you good think. Bipedal, not quadrupedal running? Yes. Okay.
Mm -hmm. yeah. And really the idea, I mean, the idea of looking at you know, fossil trackways and trace fossils like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, think about it. so. I mean, one thing you can do to that to do that is to bias where you go look for fossils, right? So I don't think places that might be the best for body fossils are places that have the best for trace fossils, and you know, spend time looking that way. that down the tree. Good. I mean, is it actually pushing, or is it just sort of... Um, it's very yeah. yeah, it's like wood ducks or something like that. So. Ah! Rolling. Um, how, how, how much mortality is there from that, though? I imagine there wouldn't be a lot, because you know, there's so much in the chip, it's not advantageous to them. Yeah. Yeah, and also, I mean, sometimes, and sometimes birds are pushed out before they can fly, and so it's think about it, you know, sort of gliding versus you know, sort of parachuting. Yeah. Okay. okay anything else? And also, you could, look, you could use a, you know, look at the structure and look at what they're eating. And were, were they eating, you know, fast flying insects or were they eating, you know, carrion or anything like that? Good. Whoa, we're out of time. Um, so, sorry. Uh, so, <coughs> insects. Insects are weird um, and wonderful. So, they fly two different ways. Okay, so this is a ladybug. Ladybugs have wings. And they fly the way you think they should fly, right? They have muscles attached to wings, and the muscles move the wings. Okay, makes sense. Like growing a Greek plate, right? Dragonflies move by flexing their chest cavity, and that sort of adjusts, makes their wings go. It's a very different way. So it's sort of rather than direct flight muscles, it's indirect flight muscles. Okay. <coughs> so, you know, the question is, did they evolve flight twice? Or, you know, have they just re completely re-evolved how they, how they move their muscles, okay, um, for flight? Um, and one idea was that they sort of evolved to use it with flying, with, with gliding, so dispersal of insects on water surfaces and being blown and needing to steer. There's still lots of questions about insect flight. Um, <coughs> and here's silverfish, which is a, um, uh, which is not flying at all, never ancestrally not, not flying. 
So if you're bored studying things in the treetops and flick things off branches because you're bored, um, some people did this and discovered, oh wow, they can actually steer back to trees. Okay, and then with ants and other things too, they sort of flick them off trees and, and insects aren't subject to ethical guidelines apparently. Um, <coughs> and so see evidence of gliding. Uh, and then bats and pterosaurs, but we're out of time. All right. Good. All right. I will see you on Friday. Oh, you can give me your quizzes. You get credit. Yeah,